listening to the Why Are You Interview Podcast, Episode 23. Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Why Are You, an interview podcast about identity. In our last show, we met an artist whose art permeates her sense of life. In this episode, we meet Morgan, whose love of words and history contribute to seeing modern life as just another phase of humanity, one with problems similar to those in the Iliad. This content is brought to you by subscribers of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber, thank you very much. If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as my writing and the writing of Gender Identity Today contributors, please consider subscribing using links you're going to find in the show notes. I hope you enjoy this interview with Morgan. Okay, and today I am joined by Morgan. First of all, Morgan, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about Why Are You? Absolutely. I'm really excited to be here. Wait until the end of the recording and I'll ask you again. Whether that's <laughs> all right. <laughs> really true. So, unlike everybody else I know, I do not know you through medium. You, you are not a writer. Instead, I know you through a, a women's network we both are, are members of. Um, called Dreamers and Doers. I can stick a link in the show notes, because why not? A little bit of a, you know, pumping up. But one of the things I know that you and I talked about early on, I mean, first of all, was some etymology, which is fun. I like that. Mm -hmm. But I know you have a background in history, in, in Mediterranean history. For, for, the, for the rest of, of Americans, you know, not me. Um, can you remind us what countries like Mediterranean history would cover what you would have studied in school? Absolutely, yeah. So I went to one of those um, uh, hippy-dippy colleges where you can design your own major. Uh, oh, and cool. So, okay. uh, yeah, so I picked um, ancient Mediterranean history. And what I was looking at was mainly the East Mediterranean um, during the Iron Age. And so oh the God. reason I chose that is because there is a ton of trade happening between um, Egypt, Cyprus, um, the Levant, Turkey, um, Greece, and then all of the countries that sort of were having trade routes that went through those countries. Sure. And so um, there was a lot of different ideas and goods being transferred sort of all over that region, um, right? And then the civilizations that are sort of on the edges of those countries also transporting goods through, right? So Mesopotamia having, you know, goods coming through the Levant, through the Mediterranean and over to Greece, for example. Okay. So why, why in the Iron Age, I mean, you know, why in particular the Iron Age? It seem, seems like, for what it's worth, not being much of a history person, like the Bronze Age was was a big moment of, oh my gosh, look at all these things we could do. Like the Iron Age was, hey, we can stab each other much more effectively yeah. with this and sharpen it much better. But Totally. So I, I actually do love the Bronze Age a little bit better. Okay. Um, but when I was doing my, my studies and my thesis... Um, there's a, a dark ages in the Bronze Age where oh, we know. don't have a lot of information. Um, I actually just watched an HBO documentary that was fantastic that went into this. Um, hmm. And I think a lot of scholarship has come out in the last several years that opened up and, and made more clear what was going on during that period. Um, but when I when I was in college, I just didn't have the resources available to me to really um, do anything substantive with the Bronze Age that hadn't really been covered all already. Um, like I sort of what introduced me to um, to thinking about doing this this studies was I've always been fascinated by um, the Trojan War and Trojan history. And, um, you know, that's, that's an area that's been studied a lot. 
Mm -hmm. And so as I was thinking about what to do with my thesis, I was like, well, I don't really want to do just like the same thing everybody else has done about Troy. Um, And so it's sort of... You know, if I, if I could go back, I, I would completely redo <laughs> my entire thesis um, and what Wait, I focused on. But, why? Um, Wait, what did you focus on then? Was yeah, it the so, Trojan War? No, so I didn't. Um, what I ended up focusing on was um, there was a lot of scholarship between like the 60s and 80s that, that came out that said okay. that the Mesopotamian goddess Ishtar, the Phoenician sure. goddess Astarte, and the Greek goddess Aphrodite are, are cognates, are basically sure. the, the same goddess, just slap a new name on her. Um, and so what my thesis ended up being was um, sort of looking at the scholarship that said that, saying, do we have enough I evidence see. to even claim this? Um, mm-hmm. And we don't. (laughs) Um, And the reason that the Eastern Mediterranean during the Iron Age came in is because Cyprus um, was a very large trade port during this period. And so that's where you had ideas being um, crossed. It's considered the birthplace of Aphrodite, um, is in in Paphos in Cyprus. And... um, and so there's a lot of material culture left over around Aphrodite, which we have okay. the most material culture for, um, and then sort of looking back at what other material culture and um, what other writings do we have that can make that connection and claim. Right. All right. You know, I had not, I didn't know any of this, but now that you have brought it up, I mean, I didn't know about your your, your thesis there. Because my understanding of Astarte is she's more of a of a fertility goddess, but that's like I, agricultural fertility, mm-hmm. not necessarily or in livestock, but not not like Aphrodite, who is more of a romantic love. And then Ishtar, that I knew that I you know I'm not no expert here, but I thought of that was more of like a, like a carnal love, more of a of you know a sexual kind of love. Mm-hmm. Am I, am I getting any of this correct? Or, I mean, you're nodding, which makes me think, maybe I'm not way off, but... Yeah, so you're getting at, like, the original question that made me look into this was, um, was because uh, Ishtar is both a goddess of war and a goddess of, of carnal love, of, of sex, of, sure. Um, sure. of intimacy. And so you had this scholarship that was saying all three of these goddesses have these both, both of these attributes. And I originally had wanted it to look into like, why are both of these attributes, you know, um, represented by the same goddess. Um, but, but you are getting at sort of what that scholarship missed is that the evidence for, um, so Astarte, particularly when you get into her, her mentions in um, Egypt, when when she's written about in Egypt, it is um, a lot more of a, a warfaring goddess there. Um, okay. And that the, and if I'm remembering this correctly, I, I don't actually do anything with this knowledge anymore, so I've, I've forgotten probably more than I remember, but that um, Astarte, there's more iconography and more um, material remains to say that she had higher warfaring attributes than, okay. um, than Aphrodite. And then within Aphrodite, because Aphrodite does, you know, get it, um, become part of the Roman pantheon and, and becomes Venus. What you see is that like the early writings about Aphrodite is a very, um, intense desire like the word that they use to describe her is like you're seized with desire and there is this like violent like whether you like it or not Aphrodite's coming for you um oh my gosh okay and then as you go on in Greek history and then into Roman history she becomes much softer much more maternal much more of that fertility caregiving goddess energy Um, okay and so what, and then, like I mentioned with that Ishtar, um, 
you know, she had strong material culture for both being a goddess of war and a goddess of love and desire and, and mm -hmm. like that carnal edge. Um, and so what you really see more is just like through the time periods that, that like seized with desire side of it goes away and becomes okay. much more fertility like lovey-dovey and it gets rewritten as just like oh they're all fertility goddesses <laughs> okay interesting yeah that that all three goddesses would be related both to ideas of birth and death is not a surprise mm -hmm. i mean given you know divine feminine having to do with creation i mean you know completion mm -hmm. not a surprise but um thank you this is scholarship yeah. i never knew yeah, absolutely. It's fun uh, for me to talk about. Yeah, and no, I think we could probably go on forever. And I was I was considering doing that, just going, you know what, I have a bunch of questions, but like chuck them out, that's no fun. <laughs> but but I'll, I'll, there there was a, a you know a question that I thought that I wanted to ask be, because I've known people who have done history, and so you, I mean, especially like Iron Age, when you look back to like Iron Age type stuff, there was a lot of very formational you know, philosophy, you know, religious, uh, economic theory. I mean, there's a lot of, of formational thought that occurred during the Iron Age that I think we all go, well, yeah, but it was the Renaissance, right? It was, we became intelligent about the time of the Renaissance, despite the fact that we learned how to smelt ore and, and make steel. Mm -hmm. But you know, mm -hmm. beside the yeah. point, I guess. So, but what I was going to ask you, I've known other history majors and I, and, and, you know, it's an interesting question. Like, why would you want to, why would you want to study history? Does, does this change your current perspective on like issues today? Yeah. Um, man, this was the question I hated most in <clears throat> like thesis defense was like, why should we care? And it's like, I mean, it's important as a culture that we know this, but like, I don't care if you yourself care. Like I, there's plenty of things that I don't care about. I can understand their importance, but like, I'm not going to spend my time with. That's a whole other aside. Um, sure. And, but, and that wasn't my question, you know, totally. I was hated getting that. Hey, is this going to be on the test? And you're like, just shut up. Who cares? Right. Learn yeah. it. Yeah. I'm not going to totally. tell you if it's on the test, but so go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no. So, um, you know, in one way, I don't know how to answer that question because <laughs> I've always been interested in history. And so that's been a lens of mine for so long that I wouldn't okay. even know what it's like to step outside of that lens. Um, I understand. You know, what I will say is that um, I think I think it speaks, the, the biggest difference I have seen between my lens of having this understanding of ancient history and what I sort of see in the general pop culture ideas is that ancient civilizations were absolutely complex and advanced. Oh, sure. Yeah. And that there's this like weird idea circulating in some circles that were the pinnacle of human evolution and that, yes. you know, everybody that came before didn't know better and like, didn't have the tools to be able to do all of these cool things. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that idea is very, very harmful because it presupposes that, you know, everything that like currently we know everything that we have the best solutions to everything and right. that it, it means that looking in the past becomes a hobby instead of a very necessary tool for us to be both better citizens of the world and within our cultures. Right, right. Yeah. I, th I think it also makes it very easy to, you know, the term that, the term that gets used uh, all the time, at least in the, the LGBTQ community, is that it's easy to other other 
uh, cultures because mm-hmm. yeah. you go well we're the pinnacle of cultures right and yeah. and if you you have people who don't have you know the iPhone 14 or whatever version it is I don't know um, you know if they don't have that they must not be civilized right they don't even have an iPhone mm-hmm. what is wrong with them exactly. so it's easy to other you know the those those cultures mm-hmm. when there's a ton that you can learn from you know from all kinds of things yeah. um, indigenous peoples in particular on on how to live and live with the earth exactly not to go yeah. on a soapbox or anything but you know totally totally yeah so 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 thank you that's a i, I appreciate that perspective one of the other things that you and i have spoken about is etymology and you even used one of my favorite words which is cognate right the idea oh. that that there's um you know that that there that there are lines of thoughts that that you know flow parallel to each other mm-hmm. i'm making the word cognate all poetic when like it is not at all intended to be poetic which is a bit of irony to it but did your did your interest in it etymo- um in etymology does that feed into his your your love of history i mean are they circular do they you know mm-hmm. Did that question come out well at all? Should I try absolutely, again? absolutely, yes. Um, it it absolutely um, is foundational for for my love of history. So I okay. started like very preliminarily understanding what uh, etymology was um, because of my name. So sure, um, you know, I I was named after Morgan Le Fay, and. I always felt like a deep connection to that. Um, And so when I was very young, like, I don't know, six or seven, I started looking into like the history of the name Morgan. Um, Mm. And, and, you know, and found out that it's Welsh and and all this jazz. And that sort of like sparked my interest and like made me realize this, there's this whole other world of etymology where the things and the words that I use have, you know, more further to meaning. them. Yeah, further yeah. meaning. Um, and this, and then this got further, further interested because I, I actually changed the spelling of my name. Um, so I, I was originally named how you see Morgan always spelled, um, and I hated it. I absolutely hated that spelling. I liked the name Morgan. I liked that I was named after Morgan Le Fay, but I hated the spelling. Um, sure. And then I ended up finding my, my current spelling, and um, and that's M O R G A I N E, um, and I fell in love with it. And so then I went on a whole research binge on okay, where does this name come from? Um, sure. And so it's from when. Arthurian legend started making its way through Europe, and that's how the French translated the Welsh name Morgan. Sure. Um, and so, and written that way, I believe in in Thomas Mallory's *Le Mort d'Arthur*. My horrible French pronunciation, forgive me, but you know, I haven't actually read *Le Mort d'Arthur*, and you I don't pronounced know. It better. I don't think so. Well. Two semesters of French one should give me something. <laughs> it should. Right. More than I got, but uh, um, n- nonetheless, though, I mean, so because it was French. So sorry, mm-hmm. I didn't mean to derail that. Yeah, I don't no. want to. So um, right yeah. as that myth moved into 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 um, you know Gaul anyway. Mm-hmm. Exactly, and so it just made me. I always felt this connection to history because of my name. And then that sort of bloomed, um, and and because I had had the introduction to etymology through my name, then sure. I started, you know, getting more interested in, in etymology. Um, my mother loves etymology, and so um, we always use the the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, because right. it has sure. all of the etymology, um, and so that just became sort of one of the things that's sort of a side little interest of like, oh, Mm -hmm. how does this all relate? Um, Right. Do do you have a favorite word? Mm. I just pulled this out of the air. Do you have a favorite word though? I do. Um, One of my favorite words is atavistic. 
Atavistic. That's Atavistic. a good one. Atavistic. Yes. Yes. Can you, um, can you tell me why? It what feels is the etymology right. for that? Word? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just. Um, yeah, it has nothing to do with the, the etymology. I just really like the imagery that it pulls up, um, and and it's like how it looks is is good. Um, sure. And and this is probably a good place for me to say that I'm dyslexic, and so um, spelling has always been very difficult for me, and I have a very interesting relationship to words I, I think sometimes and so there's just something about the word atavistic that just makes my soul happy <laughs> sure i'm i'm think of it thinking of it in cursive too and going from the the a to the v to the i would mm -hmm. be this sounds like i'm about to to break into song there but <laughs> but going from the a to the to the to, sorry a v i like that would be hard to do those all those connections in cursive mm -hmm. would be hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I just started re writing in cursive again for like the first time in 30 years. So <laughs> more than that. Oh, man. So Kudos. things that I'm thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> there was actually a purpose for it that I won't go into, but yeah, le relearning cursive is is uh, that was a chore. But I um, but I like I like that. So you like the way it sounds. You like the way how like you like the way it looks. For some reason, I'm, I'm going to throw this out here. I'm, we're going to lose. We're going to lose like half the half the listeners with this. I always like the word merge. Oh, merge! Okay. It just kind of goes. It falls out of your mouth. You go, well, merge. And if I if you say it, you like you can see two things coming together. They 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 merge. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is very self-descriptive in a way. Yeah. Almost onomatopoeic. Right. But not really. Um, okay, so now everybody who didn't like etymology can come back in. Yeah. Come back in. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Um, I'm going to tell you, so you had you had mentioned to me before that you had been, for, actually, your parents, I guess, were Arthur, were Arthur Myth fans? Do they, do they like that? or My mom, in, in particular, um, okay. really, really okay. liked... Um, Specifically, the Mists of Avalon um, by okay. uh, Marion Zimmer Bradley. Um, yes, you know, and so and, Very and in with that. Um, Mists of Avalon, they they spell Morgan the way that my name is spelled. Yes, right, right, because uh, yeah, the the Welsh right. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about that in terms of the Irish and the and the Welsh spellings of it, but mm -hmm. um, so. I've, I mean, I just mentioned to you, I, I, I do really love the mists of Avalon. I'm also a huge Arthur myth, mm. like buff. Mm -hmm. I could probably, I got a couple of books behind me here <clears throat> about the Arthur myth. It's just a couple, <laughs> like eight. So, um, so I want to, so I want to, to delve into the, any of the Lafay stuff because that's just what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, because I want to pretend, if if you were if you were like a magical, you know, like here you're magic, you're Morgan Morgan Le Fay, and you're magical, but you're a historian, and I'm curious, can you can you stick yourself into history? Can we can we write a little a little historical fiction, sorta? You okay with that? Oh man, I I'm intrigued. I'll walk you through it. Okay. Yeah, I'll walk you through it. Don't All right. Sense. I might need some hand holding, but yeah, I'm I'm down. Let's try <laughs> no, this. No, believe me, it won't be a big deal. So so imagine so man, and then I would love, gosh, even, especially if you do like Iron Age Mediterranean, <laughs> if you could live the life of some historical figure, particularly if it could be what you've studied. So first of so first off, who would that be? Mm. Oh man. You'd think that I would have this already down. Um, Not really. So th there's no, as far as I know, there's no strong historical evidence to say anyone from the Iliad actually ever existed. We can say sure. a war happened. Um, 
but I would be particularly interested to go back to um, sort of like the height of Troy, which is, um, I don't know the exact timeline there, but it is before the, the fall of, of Troy. And I would love to be just some person during the height of Troy. That would be delightful. Well, how, but somebody, so, so in particular, is there, is there a particular person? Because um, this would be amazing. I mean, now, you know, it's like, well. Oh, man. Or somebody in the Iliad, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. You who? should be like Hector. Right. Yeah. H Hector, I mean, I always, I, I've had a soft spot for Achilles. Um, and so <laughs> I, I always took the you, Greek side. You might call it an Achilles heel. For, right, exactly, for him, exactly. So let's, let's pretend I'm Achilles. <laughs> I just want to apologize for that crummy joke. So. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Did you? Okay. I did. So, so I forget. So Achilles, I believe, was dipped in the river Styx. Is that how that story goes? Yes, that, that that's okay. part of his, his legend, and his mother um, held him by his heel to dip him sure. in, and where her fingers, you know, held him by his heel is where the water didn't make him immortal. Okay. See, what came, was he, was he, I'm trying to remember, because that was supposed to be like he couldn't be pierced, I think is what it was, because wouldn't you figure, just get blunt instruments then? <laughs> Right, right. I mean, you, I don't, you know, I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to like re, like overthink this and just kind of but like just club. Oh, you right, know, right. What are you yeah. doing? Well, yeah. we can't stab you, so funk. You drop a rock on the guy. Like, you know, how yeah. tough could this be? I mean, he's also you know half half god. Like he's he's demigod. Right. So you know, supposedly he's True. really like excels as he was he was the best of the greeks you know so yeah so you know anyway achilles yeah. if you're out there i'm sorry i didn't mean right. to, to criticize you know <laughs> so if you're gonna so if you're gonna live the life of achilles so 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 far this sounds great i mean i love this um i'm actually really super interested in you know you, you'll you'll i'm sure you'll wonder why but i'm really interested in why the change in gender but because why not helen Right, you could have launched a thousand ships, but instead, you're being dipped in the river Styx. No right. ships, just sticks. So, I mean, I just I've read too many uh, historical fiction Damsel pieces about, distress about things Helen, things. Yeah. and yeah. there's there's like ten million ways that I already know her story can go. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. And you, you're willing to eject that? Yeah, I, I understand that completely. So. Yeah. Okay, so let's say you're Achilles now. W one of the big questions here, what would you change in the story? Mm. Mm. Well, that's a great question. Um, so the, the Iliad, at its essence, is the story of the rage of Achilles. Um, and it's the story of his rage because of a breach in trust between him and Agamemnon, his commander. Mm -hmm. um, and I, th I think what I wish you know, this is this is very clear if you study the Iliad, if you're in classics. But I think within the broader cultural understanding, there's this idea that Achilles uh, was just a warrior who was really good, and he got pissed off because he couldn't have this girl. Um, for sure. Um, but I think there's something to be said, and and there's more. Um, meet in this story when you really do realize that this is about the commitments you make when you are a person that has power 
as an mm. Agamemnon and what sure. he what that social contract between the commander and the soldiers is um, and that there was a deep breach of trust that occurred and and that I think there's a lot more lessons we can take away as a modern civilization about what it means to be a person in power and how you are stewards of the people around you's trust and care and that power is not power for power's sake. It's power with the responsibility sure. to be a good steward of that. Um, and I think that's the story that gets sort of ignored within modern understandings of the history. Sure. Because it, it kill, forgive me, you might have to remind me a little bit. Yeah. The breach of trust, I want to say Agamemnon sleeps with Achilles? So, Is that... I don't recall... I don't believe in the Iliad it says whether he actually sleeps with um, uh, Briseis, but it's... Okay. Um, he, he takes... Basically, when you were a, a soldier, you were allowed to loot. That included people. Um, and sure, so sure. they went out on you know one of their looting missions, came back, and Agamemnon went, nope, I'm going to take your loot. And that included... Right. Briseis. Right. Um, okay. And so that was the breach of trust, that, you know, there okay. was a, this social contract that, you, you know, the soldiers are putting their lives on the line, and as part right. of that reward, you get to go out and enrich yourself. Um, and that that was that breach. Um, and... And so all of that together, it, it's more the taking of it. Um, and I don't believe mm -hmm. that we know for sure if he actually sleeps with with her. No, uh, but I remember that though. Yeah, that that uh, it ends. You know, it's almost almost like a, a. I hate to use this phrase, but it's almost like you know, uh, stealing property. Mm -hmm. I hate to use that phrase because yeah. it was you know a woman, and that's kind of disgusting. But mm -hmm. yeah. Um, because Achilles, if I remember, like, Achilles goes home or he's not going to fight, right? I mean, he ends up going, no, I'm not going to fight for you guys. Screw you. Yeah, so he stays, but he stops fighting. Um, okay. And, and he says, you broke your part of the agreement. Yes, okay. Uh, there is no reason for me to uphold my side of this agreement. Um, okay. And so he, he stops, and all of the Myrmidons, um, which are his, his soldiers, um, they stop fighting as well. And that starts turning the tides. They were a very elite group of soldiers. And so the, the Trojans start making more headway and start, sure. um, you know, pushing the, the Greeks, um, you know, back and, and start beating them. So if you were going to change this story, then would it be for Achilles not ultimately to fight again, but to hold Agamemnon mm. responsible? For the for his breach of uh, breach of trust. Oh, that's a great question. You know, I mean, I don't know that I would. I don't know that I would change his story. I I think that there's this beautiful dichotomy in within him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because he stops and the reason that he starts fighting again is because his um you know beloved friend maybe partner dies and that heartbreak right. stirs him in into a just fighting rage he literally fights a, a river god and wins um and like i think that there's absolute beauty in that um and also, one of, this is not in the Iliad, but in um, some of the fragmentary mythos we have from other um, writings, is that before he ever goes to Troy, his mother tells him, you know, you can either go to Troy and your name will be known throughout all of history, right? but you'll never come home. 
or you can stay here, you can have a peaceful life, you can live a long age full of, you know, a lovely family, and your, your children will remember you, your grandchildren will remember you, but after that, you won't be remembered. Yeah. You know, and he, he makes that choice to, you know, go and fight knowing that he's not going to return. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think the choice would then be not to go and fight. Like if you were, if, if I were Achilles and changing his story, that would be the choice. And. Oh, you would choose to stay home. You're saying. I don't think so. I think I would still go okay. and fight, but that it, if I was changing his story, that would be the, the decision point that that fulcrum. Okay. And, um, it, you know, there's not much more story there. You know, if I was living it, like, cool, I, I'd enjoy my life. Um, but then we wouldn't be having this conversation. <laughs> True. I don't know. There's a, I mean, that's, I love that part of the story because it, it seems like a lot of what we love to do, just as humans, is we go, well, we, I want to be famous. And I'm okay with being famous for like a stupid thing. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with being famous just for being famous. We have, there's a lot of, it's, celebrity is really the wrong term because it implies that we celebrate them in some way. Yeah. And there's some people I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't celebrate you. But as whoever you are, I'm not going to tell you. But, um, shoot, where was I going? Oh, but, you know, we want this glory, right? And we'll go, well, you know, I'm okay with like dying as long as I, um, gosh, what, were, what was that James Dean quote? Live fast, die young, and leave a beautiful corpse. Yeah. Is that how that goes? Something I think like so. that? Yeah. We love that story. Mm -hmm. We don't love the story of somebody who's like 90 years old who's able to remember, you know, a lifetime of, of gaining wisdom despite not being, you know, very glorious. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know exactly where I was going with that, but just it's interesting that Achilles ends up saying, yeah, well, I'm okay going down in a blaze of glory, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Sound like a Bon Jovi song now. Jeez. Um, I don't know. I don't think I'd want to do that. But maybe I'm wrong. I haven't yeah, had that choice. I mean, in, in my personal life, I, I, wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't make that choice. Um, but also, you know, one of those things is the Iliad was an oral tradition. So this was something, you know, what we have as the written Iliad and Odyssey stems back from, you know, um, uh, I'm blanking on bards going oh, throughout, sure. you know, all, all of the Eastern Mediterranean sure. and telling sure. these stories. And part of that is when you don't have writing, that is your history. And, and so if that's your history, that's also how you're learning about the past. And, right, right. and so, yes, there are valuable lessons to be learned, you know, from a 90 year old who's seen it all, but there's also particularly when warfare was a much more, uh, prevalent part of life. Um, and personal, yeah. And personal, that having that oral history that tells about fighting and, you know, winning wars and being a, a soldier is very important and relevant right. for your everyday life and for knowing sort of what happened before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you, you shook loose a, a thought there. Because you, you, it being an oral tradition, I mean, by the time these stories were popular, no doubt bards were, were you know, going places. And, and incidentally, I mean, bards, are, bards were great for that because if you really want to teach a lesson, you started off with a story, right? If you relate it mm -hmm. to human experience, you know, because like you can say, look, don't be a jerk. And people go... All right, thanks. Ever. But if yeah. you turn that into like 
Goldilocks or something, you know, mm-hmm. if it's if it's like a you know a Brothers Grimm type of a type of story where you end up going, oh my God, there was an axe buried in his head. I'm not going to be a jerk, right. you know. Exactly. I don't know if there's any Grimm story with an axe in a head, but <laughs> pretend like there is, okay? It sounds realistic enough. <laughs> Doesn't it? Oh my gosh, that's totally a grim thing. So, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm really going a far, far afield. But but you, the thoughts you shook loose, because by the time that these stories would have been popular, certainly the Greeks had written writing, didn't they? <laughs> written writing. <laughs> had, like, like writing um, by then, I, I would think, right? So, n- not really. And it Hmm. depends on where you are. So okay, okay, okay. The um, the the Trojan War is suspected to have taken place between around 1150 BCE and 1200 BCE. Okay. Homer didn't write down um, the Iliad until about 800 BCE. Right. Okay. So you had you didn't have writing between that period. Um, gotcha. Particularly, you know, in, in Greece and, and on the Anatolian coast. Um, okay. And so it was still all oral tradition. Um, okay. And then once you get to Homer, that's the first time this is written down. And about 800 is the earliest writings we have from archaic Greece. So I see. So the okay. Iliad um, and then Works and Days by Hesiod and something else by Hesiod are all like sort of considered the the earliest archaic Greek literature that I there see. that there exists. Okay. And then to give you context, um four hundred BCE is is around um classical Greece. So when we start talking about, you know, all of the people that, that you know, you know, Plato, Aristotle, um Socrates, sure. um, you know, they're starting right around 400 BCE. There, there's a precise date for classical Greece, um, but I stopped. I stopped paying attention around 800 BCE. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, and so there was other writings within the region. So, like Linear A and B are writings um, from much earlier. I, I think Linear A is somewhere around like 3400 BCE. Oh my gosh. Yeah, okay. I've, I've my dates are not strong in my head, so please fact check me. Um No, it sounds but, great. Um you know, just just to give you a scale there of of what's going on. Um Yeah. And 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 it certainly like the everyday person wouldn't be writing um when the, sure. the Trojan War is going on or or even um when when Homer was writing down the, this oral tradition. Okay, all right. So you, you weren't you really didn't study classical Greek at all. No, I did not. Or Greece, excuse me. Okay, all right. Because I love using this joke, which which is to say, in times like this, I remember the immortal words of Socrates, which were, "I drink what?" So. That's, no, I lifted it from a movie. That's delightful. I think I that <laughs> was just like from was like from real genius or something. Oh man, oh man, that's funny. One of my favorite jokes because a lot of people go, "Gosh, you're making me think," and that sucks. Right. I'm gonna go find a celebrity to celebrate. I'm gonna go back to Twitter. <laughs> so let's get out of that. So. The last question that I had, as long as we're doing like a historical fiction here, mm-hmm. by the way, you said you've read a lot of it. I'm curious, who are some who are some good who are authors you like about historical fiction? Oh, as long as man. I got you on the phone. Yes, um, my favorite Trojan historical fiction, fic, like t- retelling, um, is called the S- the Silence of the Girls by. Pat Baker? Ooh, I don't know that one. Okay. I'm, now I'm researching this silence. Look it up. Right. <laughs> Do it. And I can stick a... 
I can stick a link in show notes. This is the international sign for it. Links in the show notes. Right. Yeah. 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 I think, yes, that is. Okay. It was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. All right. Um, and then, I mean, I've, I've read so many retellings at this point. I, I couldn't even, I'd have to go through my book log to see all of them and we don't have time for that. <laughs> no, no, probably not. So, okay, good. Um, but as long as we're doing this, because my last question is like with Achilles, this may be difficult, but my, my last question is what, what would, what's a good fitting and beautiful ending to the story? Mm. Cause I got to tell you, if I were to throw this out here, and obviously I didn't know you were going to say Achilles, but like dragged through the city. I mean, it's not very beautiful yeah. anyway. Yeah. Corpse spit upon and, and, and dragged through the city. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what he does to, to Hector. Um, and then. Oh, gosh. No worries. I mean, but he did that. That's not... Let me go and get one of those books. <laughs> Hang on, sorry. Let me go and get one of those books. So at least I know the goddamn story before... <laughs> I'm sorry. No worries. No worries. Well, and part of it, too, is that the Iliad ends and um, Achilles is still alive. So the, the actual Wait, sack he? of Troy... Yes. So it ends okay, okay. with... Um, the, the funeral games for Patroclus. Um, okay. and, and I think the final line is something like, um, like he, his, his, the anger of Achilles was set loose and like released. Mm, yeah. Like, so it, it ends, right, right, right. The, the opening line is talking about the rage of Achilles. And I'm pretty sure the final line is, is talking about like his rage evading. Um, sure. So we don't actually have the death of Achilles in okay. in the Iliad. And so this all comes from other fragments from um, other sources. And I right. don't remember exactly how they uh, kill Achilles. I, I believe Paris does shoot him through the the Achilles heel. Yeah, through the heel. Yeah. Um and so he never sees the sack of Troy. Um, you know, he never he's never part of the Trojan horse. Um but his son is and apparently his son is like this tyrannical boy child maniac. Um hmm. and um, I think that's the thing. Okay. If I were Achilles and I were rewriting the story, I think that's the thing that he would be the saddest about is that Achilles story is about integrity at the end of it. And how his son is represented is someone that isn't necessarily about integrity. Oh. Right. And right. so if there were a way to rewrite that story so that he could impart that sense of integrity into his son. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, because he, he is a hothead. Bo both of them are hotheads. Um, but th that is one of the redeeming qualities of Achilles is his integrity. Um, right. Right. And so I think that's the thing that, like, his his story feels the most unfinished is that his son is not a great representation of some of his core values that redeem him. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yes, I I remember I remember that, I don't, the, yeah, and and the rage of Achilles was set loose or mm -hmm. set free. Yeah. So yeah, good good last line, like far better than like you know. That's all, folks. Right. But yeah. Totally. Totally. And I'm which, so excited because Homer had too. But there's a um, a new translation of the Iliad coming out that oh, wow. I am over the moon about. Um, Emily Wilson recently did a translation of the Odyssey that. Oh, okay. She was the first woman to publish a translation of the Odyssey, and sure. when she looked back at the actual like Greek 
words and verbiage, she realized how much misogyny had been put into these translations. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He, and, you know, the, the story of Odysseus is not exactly, you know, noble, but... He is it's a wor- it's piece of shit. <laughs> Rat, he's kind of a rat bastard, yeah. He really is. He really but, is. I really hate Odysseus. Um, yeah. But um, Emily Wilson is coming out with a translation of the okay. Iliad. Of the Iliad, too. Okay. That, and I am ecstatic. Uh, because if you, if you even read the opening translation of the Odyssey from, like, um, Emily Wilson versus one of the, the other um, more modern translations... Um, Sure. It is so different. Oh, gosh. In just this beautiful way. So um, I'm, I'm very will... excited to see how um, uh, Wilson's translation of the Iliad comes out. Yeah. I will have to look at this. You know, I actually remember this This translation came the of the Odyssey is, what, th- maybe four or five years old? It's fairly new. Yeah, recent, something, right? something like that. Okay. Because I, I remember hearing about that coming out and, and intending to read it, and I never never picked it up. Because the story... Odysseus is kind of a, you know, a jackass. That story is great, though, because at least what I do is I kind of go, do you realize you keep doing this? To, like, if you stop being right. such a jackass, yeah. maybe bad things would stop happening to you, and you get the flying hell home. Mm-hmm. But no, you have to keep being an idiot. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. So it's a, it's a, it's a great, um, I love the, you know what? I said merge was one of my favorite hubris, I mm. think is a great, great word. Yes. The, 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 I wrote an article about this actually, mm. the, um, the, the act of hubris and, and how that leads to a catharsis, you know, because now we think now, oh, that was very cathartic. And it's like, yes. well, no, that was a, like a breakthrough in emotion. That's different from what a catharsis, you know, was. Mm-hmm. Where is I going with any of this? Oh, hubris. The Odyssey is one big, huge story of, hey, look. <laughs> yes. You want to know how to get to hubris and miss out on catharsis? Mm-hmm. Here's, here's the story. No, and the that, guide map. Those two concepts of humorous and catharsis are very integral to ancient Greek uh, mm-hmm. stories and theater. And so, yeah. Yeah. absolutely, the Iliad, or the, excuse me, the Odyssey, um, like that is a a theme that the ancient Greeks love to hear about. And so, right. it definitely. Right absolutely plays out like that in in the odyssey well i will have to pick this up the emily yeah. emily wilson yes. translation i i rem, now that i've got your recommendation on it i will absolutely go get this because um yeah i already heard great things about it so i wish i could remember who told me but and i kind of remember going wow we're still translating the odyssey that's <laughs> But then I thought to be, it's got to be better, got to be better, you know, it's got to be, got to be good. So yeah, I'll be interested in seeing this. So, all right, that seems, so that's the fitting end to Achilles, you know, that, that he could have had more fulfillment Mm -hmm. in, in his, uh, in his story and not just ended with rage. Yeah. Um, all right. I think on, on that note, um, you know, I'll go ahead and, and, and end our conversation as well. Um, Morgan, you know, the last time I talked to you, you know, I think we could go on for hours and hours because you got a ridiculous amount of knowledge that, like, complements my, you know, lack of knowledge, I guess. So that's fun. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, you know, for coming and talking again. Um, I really appreciated it. Yeah, this was this was very fun for me. I um, like I mentioned, I I don't work in history. This is just now a, a fun right. s- side research interest of mine. Um, mm-hmm. And so the fact that I got to talk about this for for so long is is really great and really fun for me. You know, one of the things I like to. Just just sort of an aside on all of this, but one of the things that I've enjoyed about this particular podcast is people will come on and they'll be like, yeah, you know, I do such and such work. And I'm like, I don't care. 
<laughs> what I really want to talk about is is something that's important to you. And they'll be like, well, my, I mean, my work was pretty, oh, like really important to me. Oh, gosh. Okay. You know, that's, I don't, I don't like, that's fun for me, you know, to find that one yeah. background thing mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, the, anyway, totally. and, and, you know, the, partly because what that does is, is sort of bring out some vulnerability mm. and, you know, I liked that. Yeah, it's, totally. It was a great conversation. I, you know, mm. thank you. this is also a pattern in this podcast where it's like, Hey, look, thank you. And goodbye. And then it turns back into like another five minutes with a, right. <laughs> with a conversation. So, um, anyway, thank you so much. Very much appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I, I also appreciate it. In my wildest dreams, I did not expect to discuss goddesses and the Iliad with somebody who actually knows what she's talking about. Thank you, Morgan. What an amazing time. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Why Are You? If you would like to hear more, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. And until next time, remember that burning question, Why Are You?